for this video vignette here in New York City. Again, I've got a little notebook because I don't want to miss anything. Uh, this is quite important and did require a lot of research uh, to do it. Now imagine, if you will, the year is 1921, 100 years ago. And in November of that year in Washington, D.C., uh, President Harding and Secretary of State uh, Charles Evan Hughes uh, met with the superpowers of the time, uh, three superpowers, the U.S., U.K., Japan, and uh, six others who, who were not superpowers. But they wanted to f uh, form uh, this nine-power treaty that was going to be the very first disarmament conference in U.S. history, first disarmament conference. And uh, they wanted to negotiate with the Japanese so that they wouldn't build up their navy as much as the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, they, were, they were allies. Uh, World War I had ended. Uh, Woodrow Wilson in 1918 uh, declared it in the armistice. And uh, it was the end of all world wars. There were never going to be major wars anymore. And their focus was disarmament so that it could never happen again. And. Uh, that day, in that time in November, uh, something unique happened. And that's going to take me now to Indiana in 1889 in April, where a person named Herbert O. Yardley uh, was born. And he was the son of a telegrapher, and he learned how to um, uh, do uh, telegrams and telegraphy. Uh, but he went to college at uh, University of Chicago to study English literature, but he dropped out and uh, he wanted to take a $900 a year job in telegraphy. Soon after, he joined the, uh, the military, the army. He was sent to, unit, uh, to Europe and he worked in signal intelligence and they soon learned how valuable he was and how, how, how good he was with, uh, uh, with, with, the, with numbers and, and signal intelligence. So what they had done is uh, they promoted him. And when he came back to the United States uh, in 1919, uh, secretly under military intelligence, they decided to form the Cipher Bureau, the Codes and Ciphers Bureau. And in so doing, they created a slush fund, secret money, to uh, give to him uh, at, at his choosing to do what he needed to do to establish this uh, uh, crypt cryptology, this interception of messages from uh, powers around, around the world, uh, including Russia and, and soon, I'm going to tell you, Japan. Uh, what had happened is that he chose New York City, and no one knows the reason why. Maybe he just liked New York City, or there were Franklin Allen who was his friend who knew New York City, but he, he thought first of, um, uh, East, um, he considered 17 East 36th Street, and then he moved into 3 East 38th Street, which I haven't gone to, it doesn't exist, the brownstone is gone. But what was crucial is that in 1920, in July, he moved here, right behind me. This was the, what became the famous or infamous American Black Chamber. And in the front, there was actually a front company uh, called uh, the Code Compilation Company, where they provided books to uh, companies to go buy universal codes. And they sold actually very well. This company, this front company, Espionage, did very, very well. But in the back room, he had nine crypt analysts. And the government, all secretly, unbeknownst supposedly to President Harding or Secretary of State, they just knew that such an organization existed, but they had convinced uh, or made an offer they couldn't refuse to the American Telegraph and Telegraph Company and Western Union <laughs> and Western Union to uh, intercept these uh, messages and deliver them to his desk. Now the conference is going on November twelfth uh, down in Washington D.C. and the Japanese are there and they want to. Uh, be friends with the United States. They want to form a strong a alliance with the United States for future trade, economic, and business and such. Now, Yardley gets these intercepts. Now, he's really good at, at, at deciphering codes, 
but not with uh, logographic or syllabic alphabets uh, such as Japanese and Chinese. So it, it was difficult now for him and he had only days to do so. And apparently he cracked it because the end of every message ended with the word end. So he was able to match up that pictogram uh, with end and then decipher the codes. They passed it off to DC and whispered to the Secretary of State and not knowing where it came from, who Yardley is, they, the president didn't know this place existed. He didn't know it was here in Manhattan. Harding didn't know. And they told him that the Japanese priority, more than building up their naval uh, tonnage, was to uh, appease the United States and, and, and form a strong bond with them for, for the future, to be a really great ally, as they were allies in World War I. Uh, they intercepted those messages and they used it uh, uh, to their leverage to do hard negotiations, that they wanted to do a 10 to 6 tonnage agreement, so that if the U.S. or the U.K. or the lesser of the two had, say, 100 tons of warships, they could only do 60 tons. So it was 60 percent, and that proved to be a boon in World War II. So it was super successful. This happened 100 years ago in this building right here, right behind me. And what happened a after that is, uh, well, they started to cut back on the slush fund and appropriations. He had to cut back on his staff, and uh, there were literally like four people back there. And then eventually, with Herbert Hoover and uh, Henry Stimson, Secretary of State, they found out that there's a cipher of your intercepting messages. The British got word of it, and the British didn't like being their major foremost ally that their messages were intercepted. So they frowned upon it, closed down the Bureau, and left Yardley hanging because he didn't exist. You know, he, had, he had nothing. It was a slush fund. He was paid cash. No pension coming to him. No money. Nothing. Cut. Stock market crashes in 1929. He's stuck. Nothing to do. But he's a talented guy, and he's quite versatile, and he's lively, he's bright, he's smart. He's probably the foremost pre-computer cryptanalyst there is. And it is really up to debate whether William Friedman is better than him. And you could, you could, you could tell that William Friedman cut it off and such, and I'll tell you why. But um, William Friedman is the predecessor, or the, the creator of the, let's say, the forerunner to the NSA. So in 1929, when they closed this down, they actually moved to 52 Vanderbilt Avenue. So there were three places where they were working. From 52 Vanderbilt Avenue, William, William Friedman collected all the data that they have done for the past uh, 10 years and brought it down to Washington, D.C., and opened up the SIS, the Signal Intelligence Service. And that was the forerunner to the NSA. Yardley was out of work, they didn't want him, and the Brits, you know, they were really angry about what had happened. So he needed to do stuff, so he started teaching and talking about espionage and such like that. And then what he does, he writes a book. He writes a book, The American Black Chamber, because this thing is called The Black Chamber. And he writes this book, and it's a tell-all about how they did it. For him, it was fun. It was solving crossword puzzles. He loved doing this stuff. It, and he didn't think it was something that was going to go on and on, there were going to be wars and such, and that intelligence was going to be so important to deciphering such. But he, 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 did, he did this. He wrote this book. And this book was a bestseller and, po and published in the Saturday Evening Post. And the British went crazy. And the Japanese then translated the whole thing, and they were furious. It was a complete betrayal with the United States and ended their alliance with the U.S. Now it went further. So now, now he's blacklisted unofficially by the U.S. government. No work for him, nothing to do. Though he's a genius, he's a genius at it. And like I said, maybe better than Friedman. Uh, that's up to debate. So what happens now? He's looking for work. He starts working in Canada. He starts selling real estate on Long Island. He starts... Um, uh, uh, teaching and and then the Generalissimo uh, Chiang Kai-shek of China, it, it, Japan invades China in Manchuria and such, and the Japan the Chinese need intelligence. Who better than Yardley to intercept Japanese codes in China? So he's hired to go over there and work for them, and he helps the Chinese to successfully defeat the Japanese by intercepting their messages. Now, the United States wants some of this information, and they ask Yardley for it. And he says, okay, 
yeah, sure. Uh, but I'd like to be compensated. You know, you folk in, in, uh, in Washington seem to be well paid with the work you do. I would like to be compensated for the work that I'm doing. And that never materialized, so they didn't get it. So it, they, were, they were really rubbing elbows here uh, with each other between the U.S. intelligence and, and, and Yardley itself. Uh, after that, uh, the book is pulled off the shelves, and then the Secrets Act is brought up because they couldn't prosecute him because there was nothing wrong with publishing a book about secrets. It wasn't secret back then in 1931, so the Secrets Act came out under Congress, and you could no longer do it. And this is where people today start comparing him to Snowden and doing this and that. It was not the same. This is a guy who created and created the codes. He intercepted Woodrow Wilson's message and decoded it in that. Uh, in uh, two hours and said, you've got 10-year-old system working here, it's no good. And he ended up creating a whole new technique of uh, decipherment, of no encryption, and uh, gave it to the U.S. to use so they can safely transmit messages. Because it was all wide, in the o wide open. So he recognized, he, he was like a great hack, and he said he did so to point out that these are your flaws. This is the problem in the U.S. So how, you know, how are you going to uh, compete diplomatically and such? They're going to know who you are. They're, they're spying on you. So um, after that, Yardley, um, uh, he, he, he didn't work ever again for cryptology, but uh, for the, the cryptanalysis, uh, that's the word coined by William Fried Friedman, who then, then went to the NSA, as I was saying. But uh, he, uh, he, he did other work, and he moved to Florida, and he moved back uh, up, up, up north, and uh, he, um, he wrote a book called the, the Education of the Poker Player, which became a uh, bestseller. And he says, this is not Texas Hold'em where you got to give a bluff. He goes, I'm telling you through probability how to count these cards or how to know how to win at poker. It became a bestseller. Ian Fleming, the writer of James Bond novels, was so enamored with it and his little vignettes, his, his anecdotes in China and what he was doing and such over there, that he told a publisher that he knew in England you need to publish this book here in, in, in uh, Great Britain so, uh, so people can know about this guy Yardley and, uh, and the poker player. And he says, I'll do it if you write the introduction to the book. Ian Fleming did so and it became a bestseller. So Yardley was like a, a James Bond. Nevertheless, he was recognized with hero, uh, with honors. He was given a, a medal of honor and such. He's uh, recognized by the National Security Agency in honors. And he died of a major stroke. Uh, in 1958, uh, one year after his uh, book um, uh, on the poker player, and he was buried in military honors in uh, Arlington Cemetery. But that all started right here, right back here in this room, 141 East uh, 37th Street, in the back room, because the front was just a regular front company. But, and that happened uh, just 100 years ago uh, this year.